Section 13 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Crassus, Part 1. Napoleon, in one of his cynical moods, once asked his courtiers how the world would take the news of his sudden death, supposing that some chance bullet cut him off before his time they hastened to give him all sorts of flattering versions of the dismay and regret that would fill all europe no said the emperor that is not the sort of thing that would happen all that would occur would be that every one would draw a long breath and say with a sigh of relief well that's all over and so it may be surmised did things go at sulla's death when men knew that his iron hand would never interfere again in politics they felt as if a long nightmare were over and abandoning the assumed characters that they had enacted during his lifetime dropped back into their real selves instead of the majestic and united optimate party which seemed to stand so firm under his protection there was now only a mass of slack senators who wished to take life quietly with the maximum of enjoyment and a few ambitious men who felt at last that they could display their ambition without risking their necks the senate still contained some men of real ability who were loyal to the oligarchic constitution such as the epicurean general lucullus quintus metellus who had made a good military reputation the orator hortensius and catullus the son of that catullus who had fought so well against the cimbri a somewhat duller reflection of his father's virtues but the great majority were apathetic nobodies while the two persons who were most important and influential among sulla's lieutenants were men who disliked the sullen constitution simply because it gave them no scope for the display of the considerable abilities which they possessed and for the satisfaction of their ambition it is mainly on the doings of these two marcus licinius crassus and gnaeus pompeius that the politics of the next twenty years were to turn no two men could have been more unlike in character but fate was always hurling them together first as young soldiers in sulla's camp with fathers to avenge then later as consuls in the same year lastly as members of the famous first triumvirate of the idiosyncrasies of each of them we must endeavour to gain a firm grasp at first however there were circumstances which kept the ambition and the rivalry of crassus and pompey from assuming the importance which they afterwards attained in seventy eight b c men's attention was mainly occupied by certain evils which as long as sulla lived had given the government little concern because they knew that if things grew serious one nod of sulla's head would suffice to set them right when he was removed these problems suddenly began to cause alarm first there was suppressed unrest in italy the children of the proscribed deprived of all political rights the citizens of the etruscan towns who had escaped massacre but had not escaped confiscation the numerous population in the valley of the po who had obtained latin rights from pompeius strabo but wanted to become full citizens were all discontented the wrecks of the bands of carbo and the younger marius were not entirely dispersed some were pirates on the high seas others freebooters in mauritania in spain their strongest man the ex praetor sertorius had raised a really dangerous insurrection a peril to the state not so much because it was a lingering remnant of the civil war between roman and roman as because sertorius was gradually de-romanizing himself and becoming a spanish national leader rather than a representative of the old party of the populares of him we shall have more to say when we deal with the life of pompey as long as sulla lived the optimates talked of him as a tiresome survivor of a long-lost cause much as we talk of bota or de Vette. after the dictator's death it became clear that his insurrection far from dying down was distinctly spreading over a wider area and threatening to tear away the whole of spain from the roman empire it had already been the death of several incapable optimate generals 
and the ruin of several small armies the outlook in the west was gloomy but in the year that follows sulla's decease it was not sertorius who seemed the most dangerous foe of the senatorial government their main trouble was caused at home by the vain and heady consul marcus aemilius lepidus who tried in the most reckless fashion to pull down the whole of the new constitution almost before its founder's ashes were cold lepidus was a rash intruding fool whose motive was nothing more than the ill-regulated ambition of a man who does not know his own mediocrity and thirsts to be something great he draped himself in the torn and soiled mantle of saturninus and cinna and appeared in the character of a democratic saviour of society now the large majority of the people of rome and of italy disliked the senatorial regime but disliked still more the idea of the recommencement of the civil war and all its horrors the council found little support but contrived to gather in etruria an army of political refugees discontented politicians liberated slaves and even bankrupt sullen veterans the whole of this rising bears an astonishing resemblance to the doings of catiline in the same district fifteen years later it failed in much the same way when lepidus led his horde against the city the senate hastily fitted out an army against him under catullus these raw levies were just ready when the ex-consul reached the tiber and actually crossed it at the mulvian bridge and entered the compass martius here among the monuments and polling booths catullus and his legions met him and gave him a severe defeat he retreated into etruria took ship to escape his pursuers and died immediately after in sardinia whither he had fled the strongest body of his followers that held together was defeated by pompey in cisalpine gaul and its leader marcus brutus was captured and executed at mutina only a small part of lepidus's insurrectionary host headed by the praetor perpenna escaped by sea and went to join sertorius in spain there the insurgents were making marked progress they carried all before them and were not even checked when pompey in the next year led a considerable army of reinforcements from italy against them while the revolt of sertorius was taxing all the energies of rome there were two other important struggles in progress the first was the renewed war with mithridates an ill-managed and interminable struggle in which the king of pontus whom sulla had beaten with such ease and rapidity baffled all the roman generals for ten years so that even the very capable lucius lucullus the best general of really loyal mind whom the senate possessed could not entirely subdue him though he beat him in battle often enough the third and the most difficult and disgraceful of the three military problems with which the oligarchy had to deal in these troublous years was the great slave rising in italy under the thracian spartacus who beat ten roman armies and equipped forty thousand men with their spoils though he had started as the leader of no more than seventy-eight runaway gladiators scandalous as it appeared the senate could not prevent the untrained hordes of spartacus from ranging over the whole of italy from the po to the straits of regium for several years he marched and countermarched among the apennines like a second hannibal and won battles over the incapable optimate generals that were in their way hardly less notable than trebia or trasimene the government whose weakness provoked and whose incapacity protracted the three disastrous wars with sertorius mithridates and spartacus deserved to fall it only needed some one more able than the vain lepidus to lead the attack on the sullen state system and it was bound to crumble down but the blow was to be given not by one man but by two pompey was returning from spain on the one side on the other crassus was about to come to the front of him we have now to speak in detail hitherto we have barely mentioned his name marcus licinius crassus had been born in or about the year b c 107 we have already had occasion to tell how his father crassus the ex-consul and his elder brother publius fell in the great massacre of b c eighty seven hunted down by the gangs of marius 
but marcus the younger son escaped through untold perils to spain where he lay hid for many months in a cave by the seashore when he emerged from his lurking place it was to become a freebooter on the high seas at last he heard that sulla had returned to italy and sailed to join him at the head of his band of outlaws he applied to the proconsul for a military command and a detachment of troops i can only said sulla give you as helpers the ghosts of your murdered father and brother crassus quite understood his chief's meaning the optimate army was so small that there was not a man to spare the spur of revenge must serve him instead of regular resources with no more than his original band of outlaws he made a dash into marcian territory and there succeeded in raising a considerable body of troops when sulla advanced into central italy crassus guarded his flank after rome fell he was sent up into etruria where he did good service against carbo and his crew but his most striking exploit was that he saved the fortune of the day at the battle of the colline gate his wing it will be remembered was successful while that of sulla was broken and pushed back to the walls it was only delivered in the end by the help of crassus who used his own victorious legions to save his leader from destruction at the end of the civil war then crassus had achieved a brilliant military reputation of all the optimate generals there were none who were more esteemed save pompey and the ambitious and ill-fated lucretius ofella the latter was soon cut off but with the former crassus had already started that rivalry which was to endure throughout both their lives as the elder man he bitterly resented the fact that sulla always gave the high place to pompey and honoured him with a distinction and a confidence that he accorded to no other of his subordinates nevertheless crassus might have gone far and have been reckoned among the leading lights of his party if he had not managed to offend the dictator and to get himself marked down as a man who was not to be trusted hitherto his career reads like that of an adventurous soldier but in his last campaign he was beginning to show the traits which were to be so prominent in his later life that unscrupulous greed for money and that indifference as to the means by which it was to be got which were to be alike his strength and his weakness during the rest of his life sulla's anger with crassus arose from two sinister incidents at the siege of tudor in umbria crassus had captured the military chest of the democratic consuls instead of handing over its contents to the treasury he embezzled the whole for his private profit later in the war being in command in lucania and brudium he committed the unpardonable offence of slaying some local magnates whose names had never appeared in the proscription list and seized their wealth for himself now sulla though he was ruthless in bloodshedding had a system in all that he did and objected to seeing his plans for weakening the democratic party turn to the use of private greed he was deeply incensed at crassus for slaying men uncondemned by himself and when his command ran out sent him into private life with a bad mark against his name he did not prosecute him or drive him out of the senate but simply noted him down as a man not to be trusted or employed having lost his military career and being barred out of political advancement crassus turned his energies into money-making and laid the foundation of the vast fortune which he was to accumulate by lucky speculations in the property of the proscribed the italian money market was glutted with lands houses and investments belonging to the fallen democrats the man who had a little spare money to invest could at this moment buy up great masses of property which would recover their value in a few years when the glut and the panic was over and italy had settled down into quiet crassus had not very great paternal wealth his own moderate fortune reached the competent but not startling total of three hundred talents some seventy-five thousand of our money but he had amassed great sums by plunder during the war and he boldly sank every sesterce that he could scrape together in buying up depreciated lands and houses in and about rome he had his reward within a short time 
when public confidence had been restored and prices had risen to their old level he found himself a millionaire what his wealth was at this period we cannot say but at a later time it amounted after a year of exceptional expense and all sorts of political corruption to no less than seven thousand one hundred talents one million seven hundred and seventy thousand pounds of our money while sulla still lived and while the oligarchy still held together after his death crassus excluded from public life went on conquering and to conquer in the world of finance plutarch gives us most extraordinary details as to his ingenious and often undignified methods of money-making not only did he lend money at high rates of interest both to roman senators and to provincial municipalities but he invented strange devices of his own one of them was his school for the education of slaves he used to buy the raw material and have them trained as readers bookkeepers stewards and cooks it is said that he not only supervised the school but often gave lectures himself in the cooking of accounts rather than of entrees it is to be presumed the slaves who had been through his academy sold at much enhanced prices still more astonishing was his amateur fire brigade in the way in which he used it he got together a body of five hundred workmen carpenters masons and the like provided them with ropes buckets ladders and tools whenever there was a fire and fires were common as they were dangerous in the crowded city he went down at the head of his gang and called on householders whose property was in the immediate neighbourhood of the conflagration he then offered to buy their houses as they stood at a very low figure if the terrified owner consented the fire brigade was turned on and the mansion generally preserved if he refused crassus went away with his men and let the fire do its worst hence in time says plutarch he became master of a very appreciable part of the house property of rome historians have often written of this bold speculator as if money-making was his main purpose in life and politics no more than a diversion to him but he was no mere money-bag no gatherer of wealth for its own sake without any further end crassus was even more ambitious than greedy and his large accumulations of money were made for the definite end of raising himself to a high place in the state they err who represent him merely as an ingenious and shameless financier crassus had felt bitterly the ostracism from public affairs to which sulla had condemned him and he was determined to win his way back to a prominent part in politics since the oligarchy had banished him from their ranks as a corrupt and untrustworthy member he would get back to power by taking up the cause against which he had fought so strenuously in his youth crassus had in reality nothing of the democrat in him the only point on which he touched the sympathies of the democratic party was that by his enormous money-making and the place to which he had risen in the world of finance he had made himself the king and lord of the whole tribe of the publicani who as members of the equestrian order had been so badly maltreated by sulla and who were therefore constrained to fall back on their old alliance with the populares except in the fact that his interests were bound up with this class he had no further connection in feeling or sympathy with the democrats the basis of the influence which crassus wielded was no doubt his importance as the leader of the equestrian order and the publicani won by the fact that he was concerned in all their financial ventures but it was not only in commercial circles that he had extended his influence it was his object to make himself a power by having as many persons as possible of all classes interested in his success and bound to him by obligations of one sort or another two of his methods are especially dwelt on by plutarch the first was his willingness to act as patron to any one who applied to him and his constant appearance in the law courts to defend all manner of clients he was not a first-rate speaker tending to be dull and prolix but he always got up his brief and often beat better men because he came prepared with facts while they relied merely on eloquent declamation or personal abuse often when hortensius or cicero had refused to take up a case he would undertake it 
for he considered few persons too unimportant to be worth serving an obliging even an unctuous manner and a real capacity for taking pains in small things gained him many dependents he never neglected to return a salutation and could address an almost incredible number of citizens by their proper names in this respect he was just the opposite of his opponent pompey who was gauche and ungracious his other method of winning influence was the more practical one of getting into his net any man who seemed likely to be useful by offering to lend him money pushing young men who took to politics he was most eager to oblige not charging too heavy interest nor sometimes any interest at all he lost enormous sums of money in this way for of course he was frequently repaid neither the capital nor the interest but he got instead what he cared for even more than money a personal influence over all kinds of people in the most various walks of life so that he could pull the wires in all manner of political circles without his hand appearing for of course his debtors would do anything to keep him quiet it is this personal consideration which explains the indulgence which the senate showed him there were so many individuals in it who owed him money that their collective influence prevented him from suffering at the hands of the whole oligarchic party still these supporters were purely interested and venal and not to be relied upon like richard the third as described by moore with large gifts he gat him unsteadfast friendship the reappearance of crassus in politics came about owing to the disasters which the senate suffered in the war with spartacus several considerable armies commanded by oligarchic nonentities had been destroyed by the brigand and his horde who ranged all over southern italy at their will resolved at last to look for a competent soldier of approved capacity the senate was almost forced to use crassus who as we have already seen had gained a reputation in the civil war second only to that of pompey the other two possible men were unavailable pompey was in spain fighting sertorius lucullus in the east fighting mithridates when appointed general crassus set to work at once to discipline the beaten and demoralized legions which were handed over to him by his predecessor in command he tried all methods with them both those of persuasion and those of punishment on one occasion he is said to have used to a legion which had disbanded in the face of the enemy the terrible old punishment of decimation if we may use the word for he took by lot one man in every fifty not in every ten and put him to death whether by fear or by the good and regular pay and provisions which he secured for his men crassus got them into a better fighting mood than they had shown of late and gave spartacus the first check that he had received at last he blocked him up by a circumvallation near regium in the tip of the brutian peninsula the rebel burst out losing many men in the attempt but was chased north by crassus who at last caught him and his main body in the open field and slew them all in a battle in lucania only scattered bands got away to the north the war was practically settled when pompey suddenly appeared upon the scene the young general who was to be crassus's rival and yet his ally had just put an end to the spanish war favoured as we shall see by the lucky chance that sertorius had been murdered by his own jealous lieutenants returning with his army he caught the last bands of the defeated rebels as they tried to escape across northern italy and cut them up for this pompey took over great credit remarking that crassus had beat spartacus indeed but that he himself had torn up the war by the roots End of section thirteen section fourteen of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles Ullman. this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter six crassus part two two generals with two victorious armies were now approaching rome from the north and the south respectively both were able and ambitious and both detested the constitution of sulla and the senatorial oligarchy which stood in the way of their holding continued power 
but they also hated each other as much as they hated the senate and were inspired with the bitterest jealousy the all-important question was whether they would fight or whether they would prefer to join their forces against the optimates it was the latter alternative that they chose pompey was too irresolute and conscientious in his own way to strike hard to win a tyranny crassus had the smaller army and dreaded the military abilities of his rival hence it came to pass that they agreed to join in a campaign against the senate and the sullen constitution they stood for the consulship for b c seventy keeping their legions outside the gates as a threat to the people and senate the populace indeed did not need the threat and was ready to do anything which would annoy the fathers so pompey and crassus were duly elected consuls under the eyes as it were of their respective armies it was a mere compromise which satisfied neither of them for each thought the other's presence very unnecessary but since they were not prepared to fight and neither of them had a real conception of a policy nor a definite idea of what he himself really wanted pompey nor crassus could not ask or receive any more so these two ambitious men masquerading as democrats undid the constitution of sulla at their leisure meeting no opposition from the demoralized senate without a man of genius to lead them or an army to oppose to the two great hosts of pompey and crassus the optimates could do absolutely nothing their one great fighting man lucullus was still in the east and could not be called from thence to play the part of sulla firstly because he had no wish to do so being as careless as he was able and secondly because he could not have trusted his army to follow him in spite of all his victories he was most unpopular with his soldiery when pompey and crassus had been installed in office they proceeded to introduce a series of laws which destroyed all the main features of the sullen constitution but as we shall see they put nothing in the place of that which they were destroying and the only result of their so-called reforms was to restore the constitutional chaos and the conflict of sovereignties which had prevailed in rome from the rise of the gracchi down to sulla's legislation of b c eighty one the fact is that they were bent not on supplying rome with a workable state system nor even on harking back to the old democratic projects of saturninus and cinna but merely on smashing up those sections of the cornelian laws which stood in the way of their own ambitions if they added some other measures to their legislative output it was partly to achieve a little cheap popularity partly to make a show of having a real constructive program of their own a thing which was in fact non-existent as a first measure the various securities which sulla had provided to protect the senate against disturbance were now done away with once more as in old times the tribunes were to be permitted to propose laws to the public assembly without having first obtained the senate's leave the other disability which had been imposed on them by sulla that of never being allowed to stand for any other office if once they had chosen to take the tribunate seems already to have been removed by a law passed in b c seventy five by gaius cotta but this relief was a mere nothing to the boon now granted by pompey and crassus the right to deal with the people without any senatus auctoritas was the real strength of the tribunate in all ages secondly and in this point crassus was particularly interested the equestrian order of which he was the patron and lord was restored to its old position in the state the knights were given back the privilege of farming the taxes of asia which sulla had taken from them moreover the lex aurelia restored to them once more a predominant share in the law courts they did not obtain as in the days of gaius gracchus a monopoly of judicial power for in future juries were to be made up of three classes of citizens one-third were to be senators one-third equites one-third tribuni aerarii but the knights seem to have secured something like their old control because the third order the tribuni aerarii were from their fortune and tendencies much more akin to them than to the senators indeed they were in a sense members of the equester ordo 
this elaborate subdivision of classes in the courts does not seem if we may trust cicero and other witnesses to have made any sensible improvement in the justice which roman juries dispensed it was almost inevitable that pompey and crassus seeking to ingratiate themselves with the roman multitude should hearken back to the most popular and the most pernicious item of the old democratic programme by developing again the corn dole whose abolition had been by far the best of sulla's measures but to buy support from any class by lavish expenditure whether from his own or from the public purse was a regular part of crassus's system a moderate and limited amount of distribution had been restored as early as b c seventy eight but the consuls of b c seventy presented every citizen with corn for three months without exacting any payment crassus is also said to have given an enormous public dinner to the populace at the feast of hercules at which all comers were entertained at ten thousand tables laid down the streets another political move of the consuls was the restoration of the censorship which had been practically in abeyance since sulla's time the first new censors cornelius clodianus and gellius poplicola celebrated their advent by a wholesale eviction of sullen partisans from the senate which they could do all the more plausibly because many of the sufferers were men of blemished reputation it will be remembered that the ex consul lentulus the associate of catiline was one of the victims of this purging he was expelled for what the censors called luxury that is notorious evil living it is most noteworthy that pompey and crassus did not include in their legislation two measures which any genuine democrat would have been certain to insert in his programme the first was the cancelling of the effect of the sullen proscription it would have been natural to secure the return of the exiles and to restore their status as citizens to the sons of the proscribed whom the dictator had deprived of so many rights the second obvious measure would have been the institution of an inquiry into the awful deeds of murder and robbery which had been perpetrated without any shadow of legality during and previous to the dictatorship the reason why these subjects were left untouched was that crassus himself had been deeply implicated in the worst part of the proscription he had put men to death illegally he had seized on lands without any good title and had bought up wholesale the property of the proscribed pompey too had some acts to his account which would not have looked well when investigated in a court of law such as the executions of carbo and marcus brutus they had no doubt been declared outlaws by the senate but the officer who had put them to death would have felt some qualms in the days of a real democratic reaction it was therefore impossible for the consuls of b c seventy to raise either of these questions as it would have entailed inquiry into their own conduct and in the case of crassus the surrender of masses of ill-gotten property it was not till a real democratic program was being brought forward somewhat later by julius caesar that the idea of the punishment of the people's enemies was mooted by the celebrated trial of rabirius for the murder of saturninus as to the rank and file of sulla's assassins the only person who ever took arms against them was one of their own party the stern and rigid cato who when he was quaestor insisted on recovering from them the blood money which the dictator had issued to them without legal warrant though allied to overthrow the supremacy of the senate pompey and crassus did not learn to love each other any the better during their year of joint office their quarrels were unending they differed about every measure that came before them and these disputes and altercations prevented each of them from doing many things on which he was set it was this notorious enmity which led to a curious scene at the end of their year when it came to be time for them to make their final orations to the people on quitting office there stood forward a certain knight named gaius aurelius a person of no note who said that jupiter had appeared to him in a vision and commanded him to tell the romans that it would not be lucky for them if they allowed their consuls to remain unreconciled wherefore he suggested that they should embrace in public at this unpalatable proposal the two magistrates were much disturbed 
each stood lowering at his own corner of the rostra but when the people continued shouting for a long space of time that the consuls must be reconciled crassus at least constrained himself for he was far the better hypocrite of the two went up to pompey and offered him his hand with a well-turned compliment they embraced and parted and hated each other rather more than before the humorous aurelius must have extracted huge enjoyment from the little comedy the two years that followed the resignation of the consuls on december thirty first b c seventy are most difficult to understand we should have expected that the enmity of pompey and crassus would have led them into some open outbreak against each other the moment that they had ceased to be colleagues but nothing of the kind happened it seemed as if each had destroyed his rival's power of initiative they remained watching each other and did nothing more the senate which had thought that its last day had been at hand was able to breathe again and to seek feebly to reassert itself it had been generally expected that pompey would choose some important province and would provide himself with another army to replace that which he had disbanded after his spanish triumph but this was far from his thoughts before his consulate expired he expressly disclaimed any such idea and for the whole of sixty nine to sixty eight he remained quietly in rome living the life of a private citizen probably the sight of his rival in retirement soothed down the anger of crassus who would half expected him to aim at a tyranny for he too kept quiet and relapsed into his normal round of money-making and wire-pulling on the back stairs side of politics so things remained the two great men keeping each other under close observation but making no offensive move till pompey was at last called away by the gabinian law b c sixty seven which gave him the command against the pirates in consequence of this commission and of the subsequent manilian law which transferred to him the command against mithridates he was absent from rome for nearly seven years crassus had at first intrigued against the assignation of such important charges to his rival yet when he was gone was glad to see the political stage left clear for his own action while pompey was away he would have a better chance of convincing the roman people that he was their true friend and of carrying out his plans for his own personal aggrandizement but as we shall see all the political intrigues of crassus failed while pompey in the distant east was adding laurels to laurels in a way that kept his name perpetually before the citizens and made it probable that when he should return with his army at his back he might ask for anything that he chose with a perfect certainty of receiving it we seem to trace in the doings of crassus during pompey's absence in the east a progressive series of measures by which he hoped to commend himself to the democratic party and to establish himself as their leader so firmly that his position should be unassailable on his rival's return he had now bought himself a most able managing partner in the person of julius caesar whose first prominent appearance in politics belongs to these years the young man possessed the two gifts of eloquence and geniality in which both crassus and pompey were so hopelessly lacking but at this period of his career he was impecunious and a trifle disreputable no one foresaw in him the future dictator and the founder of the monarchy at this time he was absorbing crassus's money at a preposterous rate and flinging it about with both hands men looked upon him much as they looked upon clodius ten years later and never suspected that the lieutenant of crassus was more than a splendid mob orator and a skilled manager of corner boys the chief landmarks of this period of crassus's political career are a series of bids for popularity which failed to produce the desired effect as kensor in b c sixty five he tried to enroll as full citizens the entire population of cisalpine gaul but his colleague catullus refused to recognize the grant and the optimates continued to deny it right down to the civil war another and more ambitious scheme was the bill to annex egypt in the same year 
the chief object of which seems to have been to find an excuse for giving caesar an army which might serve as a counterpoise to that of pompey but the senate succeeded in stopping the design a little later it would seem that the democrats were growing more desperate caesar's attack on riberius was a warning to the optimates that extreme measures might be tried against them if they stood in the way of his employer's road to power but the bill of servilius rulus was far more startling it styled itself an agrarian law but was much more like a measure for suspending the constitution with the ostensible object of relieving economic distress at rome it proposed to create a body of decemvirs with far greater powers than the triumviri agris dandis assignandis of tiberius gracchus had ever held these land commissioners of whom crassus and caesar were to be the chiefs were to be granted the military imperium and the right to levy troops they were to be permitted to select two hundred subaltern officers from among the equites to have power to sell the public lands in italy and in the provinces to plant colonies to take out of the treasury whatever they wished and to sit in judgment in all lawsuits which might arise from their own proceedings considering that the law was mainly levelled against pompey for it was of him rather than of the senate that crassus was in fear it was adding insult to injury to place the public lands and revenues of syria and the other newly annexed eastern provinces at the disposition of the land commissioners the immense machinery provided by rulus was so disproportionate to the task which had had to serve and the power given to the decemvirs so inordinate their very name recalled the old tyrannical ten of b c four fifty one to four fifty and the misdoings of appius claudius that the bill failed to pass cicero headed against it a combination of the optimates and the friends of pompey who when allied proved able to triumph over the democrats in spite of all the bribes of crassus and all the eloquence of caesar but the agrarian law of rulus was not the strangest project that was attributed to the two democratic leaders there were many who accused them of being implicated also in the reckless plots of lucius sergius catalina it is impossible to arrive at any certain conclusion concerning the character and scope of the so-called catalinarian conspiracies if we were to accept in its entirety the official narrative which was composed by cicero and practically embodied wholesale in sallust and most other historians we should regard the participation of crassus in the designs of catiline as most improbable we are told that the leader of the plot was a monster of depravity a sort of malignant demon in human form who after spending his early years in murdering his relatives and debauching all the youth of rome wished in his middle age to inaugurate a reign of caides and incendium to massacre the senate burn the city and rule as a tyrant among the corpses and the smoking ruins if there were any truth in all this we should conclude that crassus as the largest householder in rome was not likely to be privy to a plan for wholesale incendiarism and as the greatest creditor in the city would hardly wish to massacre a senate in which a vast number of the members owed him large sums of money but cicero himself furnishes us with much evidence for doubting his own narrative if catiline was such a notorious villain it is odd that the orator should have proposed to run with him as a joint candidate for the consulship and have offered to defend him when he was going to be indicted for extortion in his late province of africa still stranger are cicero's statements in the Procylio, where defending a friend of the conspirator he remarks that he was always meeting catiline in the best society i thought him a good citizen and esteemed him for the many eminent virtues which he seemed to possess if it was possible for cicero to make such allegations with any show of good faith it is clear that catiline cannot have been the social pariah who is described in the orator's speeches of b c sixty three evidently the fluent consul thinking his own neck in danger had painted his foe and all concerned with him in very lurid colours End of section fourteen
Section 15 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Crassus, Part 3. It is impossible, on the other hand, to believe with Professor Beasley that Catiline was a respectable politician and the avowed head of the Democratic Party at Rome during the years 65 to 63 BC if he had been beyond reproach sallust and other historians of the caesarian faction would have taken the opportunity to represent him as a martyr to the jealousy of the optimates and a victim of cicero's spiteful tongue since they did not dare to take this line and reproduce the orator's account of him almost verbatim we are driven to conclude that the insurgent chief was really a man of doubtful character and reckless designs but at the same time we are forced to believe from cicero's own evidence already quoted that he had not such a notoriously bad reputation as to make it impossible to use him as an associate or a tool in political schemes if we look upon him as no more than an unscrupulous demagogue of the same type as saturninus or clodius that is as a desperate brawler and mob leader rather than an anarchist it does not seem so unlikely that crassus and caesar may have had relations with him during the years of his activity if their plan was to have a bold and reckless democratic consul a man who would not shrink from using violence when the crisis came in power when pompey should return from the east we can well understand that they may have taken catiline into their pay he and they in short may well have been aiming at a coup d'etat though it is most improbable that they intended either to massacre the whole senate or to set the city on fire these accusations are the embroidery with which cicero adorned his orations when he wished to enlist all the men of material interests on the side of the optimates not only did he succeed at the moment for even the equites were seen with swords in their hands offering to kill caesar but he has left for all ages a stain on the name of catiline which is probably one or two shades deeper than that very unscrupulous politician really deserved the story of the catilinarian plots as we now have it is too fragmentary and too obscure to bear complete unravelling the version of the first plot in which caesar and catiline are said to have assembled a mob of assassins in order to murder the consuls of b c sixty five torquatus and cotta and then to have failed to give the signal for the onset is most unconvincing concerning the conspiracy of b c sixty three we have more details but they are very contradictory on the one hand we know that there was a widespread rumour that catiline was acting under the orders of crassus sallust no unfriendly witness allows that a great part of the senate suspected the great millionaire of being implicated in the plot on the other hand it is certain that crassus volunteered some information to cicero concerning the designs of the insurgents though that information was tardy and practically useless he is said to have come in a melodramatic manner late at night and muffled in a cloak and to have placed in the hands of cicero an anonymous letter which had been delivered to him warning him to be out of rome on the day of the preconcerted outbreak if this midnight visit really occurred it is probable that crassus was merely hedging that he told cicero what he considered would be enough to protect him from a charge of complicity if the plot should fail but not enough to do catiline and his colleagues any harm if they were going to succeed one thing is clear that cicero did not consider it prudent to assail crassus and remain deaf to all the suggestions made to him with that object another public man when incited to fall upon the millionaire once answered with the proverb fainum habit in cornu meaning that crassus was too dangerous a sort of game for a hunter of his calibre to meddle with footnote the romans used to tie a wisp of straw to the horns of a dangerous bull to warn the passer-by against him End footnote and so the consul of b c sixty three with his usual prudence refrained from accusing of high treason a man who could pull so many political strings and had at his disposal such a command of money and influence when the informer tarquinius in his examination before the senate began to give evidence incriminating crassus 
a curious scene occurred dozens of senators who owed crassus money began to shout false witness with all the power of their lungs then cicero after glancing round the house and pondering on the situation took the easiest way out of the position by remanding tarquinius to prison without permitting him to go on with his story the charge was not allowed to be repeated yet sallus tells us that crassus was so far from being grateful to cicero that he ever afterwards regarded him as an enemy apparently he thought that the orator had been feeling the pulse of the senate by producing such evidence and had only drawn back from an open attack because he saw that he would not get the full support of his party if he persisted however much or however little crassus had been implicated in the catilinarian plot this much is certain that many people thought that he had known more about the business than he should and that an additional stain was added in consequence to his already not unsmirched reputation we are told that in the end of b c sixty three he seriously thought of leaving rome to preserve his personal safety and provided ships to carry himself and his family and his treasure out of italy the reason why he did not actually depart was the unforeseen delay in the return of pompey from the east the conqueror of mithridates had finished his military work in b c sixty three by the conquest of syria he was expected back early in sixty two just when cicero's consulship had expired and while the embers of the catilinarian conspiracy were still smouldering after the main conflagration had been quenched if he had presented himself at this moment he would have found the democratic leaders in the deepest discredit and dismay and foiled in all their plans to raise up a power in italy that should be able to oppose him but pompey chose to linger in the east for the whole summer of b c sixty two pacifying and portioning out provinces and conciliating allied princes and founding new cities he showed no signs of coming home and merely sent ahead his foolish and talkative partisan metellus nepos the man whose pranks gave cicero so much trouble it will be remembered that his demands were so unreasonable and at the same time so vague that cicero and the optimates ventured to oppose them and crassus had time to recover from his panic and to reconsider his situation there can be no doubt that the follies of metellus who certainly exceeded the commission that had been given him did his employer much harm and lessened his popularity yet when in the autumn of b c sixty two pompey at last announced that he was returning to italy with his army at his back both democrats and optimates were seriously alarmed externally his position was so much like that of sulla in eighty two that both parties had a suspicion that he would be tempted to repeat sulla's role neither crassus and caesar on the one side nor catullus and cato on the other felt their heads quite safe upon their shoulders for each party knew that they had been intriguing against the great general in his absence and supposed that he might resent their action in a very drastic fashion nothing of the kind happened with rare civic virtue pompey dismissed his army and returned as a private person to rome expecting to receive from his fellow-citizens the praise and gratitude that he had so well earned instead he found the optimates captious and critical and the democrats far more concerned in the catilinarian conspiracy and its results than in the newly accomplished conquest of the east his simple and moderate requests the confirmation of his administrative work in asia and the provision of the rewards due to his victorious soldiery were refused him when he put forward his friend the tribune flavius to pass a plebiscitum for the grant of lands to the army of the east it was defeated by the unexpected and immoral combination of the optimates and the populares the great object of crassus at this time was to prevent at all costs the conclusion of an alliance between pompey and the senate lest the combination of the two should reduce himself and his party to entire impotence how he did it we learn from cicero's letters when pompey first returned to the city it would have been quite natural that he and the orator should have agreed to work together they had been old friends and allies in earlier days their political views were not dissimilar and if cicero was now the most moderate of optimates 
pompey was certainly the least democratic of democrats if the orator could have persuaded his friends to treat the great general with courtesy and ordinary consideration and to grant his very reasonable demands it is probable that matters would have settled down without any further trouble but cicero was still swelling over with pride at his successes in b c sixty three and now thought of himself quite as great a man as pompey his idea was to meet the proconsul with the phrase if you have saved the republic abroad i have saved it at home in his vanity he imagined that the crushing of catiline's handful of desperadoes was quite as great an achievement as the conquest of the east he was ready to assume an almost patronizing attitude to his old chief the wily crassus resolved to estrange the two by tempting cicero into a display of foolish pride which should disgust pompey he carried out his shameless plan at the first appearance of the great general to take his seat in the senate the occasion ought to have been utilized to welcome and compliment pompey according to his deserts but when the proceedings had been commenced crassus rose and began a fulsome and interminable harangue in praise of cicero's consulship not only was the subject matter stale for catiline had been put down a whole year before but crassus was the last man who should have launched out on such topics he was known to have resented bitterly all that the orator had done and to be his secret enemy however he began to declaim to the effect that the preservation of his own life and liberty his name and his fatherland his wife and children had all been the work of cicero that rome had been saved from fire and sword was due to this great man alone and so forth cicero fell into the trap with the greatest simplicity instead of suspecting all compliments from this most doubtful source he arose to continue the debate in his own self-laudation the opportunity for conciliating pompey by turning the discussion on his great deeds in the east and paying him his due meed of praise quite escaped him instead he proceeded to sound his own trumpet in the most autolatrous fashion writing to atticus in complete unconsciousness of his own folly he says that now was the time for my well-turned periods my flowers of rhetoric my antithesis and figures you know my wonted thunders this day they were so loud that i think that you must have heard them even where you are in epirus so having spoken at length of his own great doings of the majesty of the senate the wickedness of the late conspiracy and all his usual topics he sat down leaving pompey unblessed the general was not pleased intellexi hominem moeri says cicero who had the best chance of knowing for he was sitting next to him he took the speech as a formal declaration that cicero and his friends did not think much of his exertions in the east and he was not far wrong thus it came to pass that the shameless harangue of crassus and the idiotic vanity of cicero which made him gorge the bait so greedily began to destroy the chance that pompey might enter into an alliance with the optimate party and become a defender of the constitution his anger came to a head when at the instigation of his old enemy and rival lucullus the senate passed a decree that an elaborate inquiry should be made into all his doings in asia before they were ratified if anything was wanting to complete his discontent it was the way in which his army was treated the excuse made for denying its reward was that the treasury was empty a manifest lie for the enormous sums which had been paid in from his asiatic spoils were still unexpended so the man who might if he had been unscrupulous had become tyrant of rome found himself flouted and said it not merely because he had behaved like a good citizen and refrained from taking by violence that which was his due he might have asked for anything that he liked while his army was still undisbanded when he had dispersed it cicero's stupid friends refused to listen to his pleas and left him shamed before the eyes of his veterans while he stood involved in this bitter disappointment pompey received the offer which changed the whole face of affairs crassus and caesar and the whole democratic party were still under a cloud with a strong suspicion of complicity in the catilinarian plot hanging about them 
it would mean everything to them if pompey his respectability and his veterans were placed on their side accordingly they offered him their assistance to secure the ratification of his asiatic treaties and the grant of land for his legionaries if he would join them against the senate it must have been a bitter moment for him when he was told that his desires might be gained at the price of a second alliance with his old enemy crassus the man who had intrigued against him with such malevolent persistence all through the last ten years but rather than break his word to his soldiers whose interests he had promised to protect and rather than endure more bullying from the senate he accepted the offer the famous first triumvirate was formed pompey contributed his great name his respectability and the potential aid of forty thousand veterans crassus his inexhaustible money-bags and his power of intrigue caesar his unrivalled talent for mob management and his cool and level brain at the moment most men thought him little more than the agent and tool of the two elder triumvirs the revelation of his greatness was yet to come when the triumvirate had been formed and in spite of the opposition of cato and a few more irreconcilables had shown that it could sweep the streets and clear the forum it remained to be seen how the victorious three would use their power the first thing that strikes the observer is that while pompey got something out of his bargain and caesar a great deal we can hardly trace any positive and tangible gain received by crassus from his alliance with his old enemy pompey got his asiatic doings confirmed he was also enabled to give his veterans the land that he had promised them caesar obtained his consulship passed all the laws that he chose to bring forward and had the pleasure which to a man with his sense of humour might have been considerable of seeing his colleague bibulus shut up in his mansion and inspecting the heavens day by day without any effect moreover at the end of his year of office caesar received the all-important provinces of cisalpine and transalpine gaul the district from which legions could best overawe rome and all italy but crassus got neither consulship nor province neither land nor ratified treaties it is true that his position in politics was re-established the slur that had been left upon him after the catilinarian business was removed and he could feel that he had pulled the strings of the whole intrigue but of more definite profit we see nothing the only satisfactory explanation of this curious fact is to remember that crassus all through his career seems to have desired power as an end in itself rather than as a means to other objects he was to use a modern phrase a man without a programme he wanted to pull the wires of politics rather than to carry out some definite policy when he had collected all the wires in his hand if we seek a modern parallel for him we may think of that wonderful old whig the duke of newcastle who allied himself with the elder pitt on the terms that the latter should manage the whole imperial policy of britain while he himself should be permitted to conduct the parliamentary jobbery and intrigue in short when the opportunity came to him crassus had no particular set of measures that he wished to advocate he was neither a true democrat nor a true oligarch he had become the leader of the populares not because he had popular sympathies but because he wanted at all costs to be the leader of some party so the weakness of his position was that having achieved his wish to obtain a share of supreme power he had little that was definite to ask for he merely wanted to be able to assert himself when he chose to have his share in portioning out consulships and praetorships to make money when and how he chose and to use it by keeping dozens of minor political persons in dependence on him hence it is that in the doings of the triumvirs during their day of power it is hard to point out very much that can be ascribed to the personal initiative of crassus his main aim was to keep in check his ally pompey whom he hated no less than of old that thereby he was helping a much more able man caesar on the road to supreme power he certainly did not realize we may make a shrewd guess also that it was crassus who really set upon cicero and drove him into exile clodius being merely his tool and not the originator of the orator's woes we know from sallust and plutarch how bitter was the enmity that crassus bore to the consul of b c sixty three despite the flattery which he lavished on him when he was set on estranging him from pompey 
it was probable that the banishment of cicero was his underhand revenge for seeing his old schemes frustrated for both in the rejection of the law of rulus and in the suppression of catiline the orator had been the main cause of his defeat on the other hand it is hard to see that clodius had really any adequate cause for the malignant persecution to which he subjected cicero the usual tale that he had been angered by the way in which his ingenious alibi had been disproved while he was being tried for the violation of the mysteries of the bonadia does not seem to give a sufficient reason for his vindictive attacks on cicero if we imagine that he was spurred on by crassus the causes of whose enmity are so much more obvious the matter becomes far more intelligible if the triumvir simply delivered the blow at second hand it is quite in keeping with what we read concerning his feelings at the time plutarch tells us that he had conceived such a mortal hatred for the orator that he would have shown it by some act of personal violence had he not been dissuaded by his son publius who chanced to be an old pupil and an admirer of cicero crassus was certainly closely connected with clodius whose acquittal at his trial for the violation of the mysteries he had secured by his lavish bribery he was the only one of the triumvirs who did not try to save cicero from the worst extreme of exile by pressing on him an honourable excuse for absence from rome in the shape of a legateship or a free commission to travel that the orator himself suspected him of being at the bottom of his troubles may be judged from the fact that when writing from thessalonica during his banishment and estimating his chances of return he speaks of pompey as certain to be favourable crassus tamen metuo he had a fear that crassus might not prove so accommodating however having learnt the lesson that it was not wise to cross the triumvirs cicero was ultimately allowed to return and soon after was formally reconciled to the millionaire by means of the young publius his faithful friend End of section fifteen section sixteen of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter six crassus part four we have on the whole extraordinarily little recorded of the doings of crassus between b c fifty nine and b c fifty six a time when he ought to have been able to ask and obtain whatever he chose from his colleagues he had his share no doubt in the management of affairs by the triumvirs in that rather chaotic time when to the outward eye clodius rather than any one else seemed to be the real ruler of rome but apparently he was as usual more set on checking pompey than on anything else it is only in b c fifty six that he again comes to the front by that time he had at last learnt from the study of caesar's doings in gaul that any man who aspired to take his share in dominating roman politics must have an army at his back hence it was that at the conference of lucca he claimed not only the consulship for b c fifty five but the command of the army of the east he too must raise his legions win his victories and be in a position to meet caesar and pompey on equal terms if troubles should ever again break out those superficial writers who think that he chose the rich eastern provinces out of mere greed and avarice are clearly wrong all through his life money-making was to him the means and not the end what he really wanted to secure was a loyal army not a few more millions to add to his hordes that military glory had turned his brain and that he desired to emulate alexander the great and to penetrate to the bactrians the indians and the erythrian sea so that in his hopes he swallowed up the whole east we cannot readily believe clearly he wished to win a strong military position such as could be secured by great conquests beyond the euphrates but it was needed mainly to help him sway the balance between caesar and pompey in the domestic affairs of rome nevertheless when he had once been granted his desire and placed in command of an army his spirit seemed to have risen 
his mind harked back to his old campaigns of eighty two and seventy one b c and he appears to have cast from him the memories of twenty years of finance and intrigue and to have tried to become once more the enterprising soldier that he had been in sulla's day he showed a buoyancy of spirit that surprised every one indulging in vain boasts most inconsistent with his wonted demeanour and most unsuitable to his age and disposition for in general he was far from being either self-assertive or conceited but now he said he would make the expedition of lucullus against tigranes and that of pompey against mithridates appear mere child's play yet he now counted sixty years and looked even older than he really was the renewal of the triumvirate had so cowed the optimate party that even cato had to give up his attempt to struggle against the omnipotent three it is therefore all the more curious to find that one man set himself to oppose crassus's designs and that from mere personal enmity this abnormal personage was the tribune gaius ateus capito one of those strange characters who move for an instant across the political stage and are then lost in obscurity he ventured to place a veto on the levying of legions for crassus it was quietly disregarded then he announced awful hindrances of portents and prodigies which were also met with derision rather than attention indeed he was fined by the censor appius for fabricating false omens but he reserved his great coup for the day on which crassus passed out of the gates to take command of his army after one final and futile attempt to interpose his tribunitial veto he took refuge in strange incantations he placed a censer at the gate we are told and threw incense upon it uttering the most horrid imprecations and invoking strange and dreadful deities the romans say that these mysterious and ancient curses have such power that the man against whom they are directed never escapes ill luck nay more they add that the person who uses them is sure to bring misfortune on himself too undaunted by these antiquated rites and regardless of two or three other evil press ages which plutarch has carefully collected crassus set forth from italy and arrived safely in syria where he found himself at the head of an army of seven legions his first act on taking charge of his province was to plunder ruthlessly the temples of hierapolis emessa and jerusalem and to scrape together all the money that could be raised by taxation but he was no doubt set on filling his military chest for a war that was certain to prove long and costly rather than on gratifying the talent for extortion that was such a marked characteristic of all his life his first strategical move was to bridge the euphrates and to establish a new base for himself in the greek cities of mesopotamia this was easily accomplished but his second advance was a much more serious matter he had now to prove whether his old martial reputation won in wars against carbo and pontius and spartacus had been fairly earned quite unconsciously crassus was going forth to solve a new and difficult military problem unlike caesar in gaul he had not to deal with an old enemy whose strength and tactics were well known the romans had met and defeated many an asiatic army during the last century but the parthians were not like the other inhabitants of the hellenized east whom scipio or sulla or pompey had so easily subdued their hosts did not consist of clumsy imitation of the macedonian phalanx but of masses of horse bowmen some were the lightest of light cavalry others bore helm and lance and breastplate as well as the national bow of infantry the parthians had none save levies raised among their subject races for operations in mountainous regions when the fight was to be in the plains they did not take a single foot soldier with them of all the regions of the border mesopotamia into which crassus was now advancing was most suitable for the tactics of the enemy the battles would be fought among rolling sandy downs destitute of trees and crossed by rivers at very unfrequent intervals confident in his seven legions and his four thousand horse the triumvir marched out from cari and entered the desolate lands that lay between his base and the parthian capital 
he had resolved to take the shortest route to seleucia in spite of the advice of the armenian allies who had endeavoured to induce him to draw near to the tigris and the assyrian mountains instead of plunging into the mesopotamian sands where the parthians could use their horsemen to the best advantage tradition tells us that he had been influenced in his resolve by the treacherous advice of an arab sheikh named ariamnis or abgarus who had told him that speed was the essential thing in his advance for as he alleged the parthian king was not intending to fight so near the roman frontier and was sending his treasures eastward and preparing to evacuate seleucia without any serious attempt to make a stand if crassus was gulled by these stories he was soon undeceived for on the second day of his march his vedettes were driven in by the parthian horse and reported that the vizier serena was close at hand with a mighty host eager to engage the triumvir pressed on to meet the enemy in full expectation of a victory that should eclipse all that pompey had ever accomplished in the east at first he drew up his men on a very long front the legions deployed in line with the cavalry in equal halves at each end of the array but presently it struck him that this formation did not sufficiently cover his enormous baggage train which was trailing along for many miles to the rear accordingly he changed his order to a great hollow square and placed all his impedimenta in the centre this would have been an excellent battle formation had he been about to contend with an enemy who deployed shock tactics and intended to charge in upon the legions but against horse archers it was a mistake it gave them a target which it would be impossible to miss and at the same time made it hard for the romans to charge without breaking their order of battle the square is an essentially defensive formation and useless against a light and evasive foe that has no wish to close when the parthians appeared at first in comparatively small numbers but afterwards in huge hordes that seemed to cover the whole horizon crassus in the usual roman style sent out his light troops to skirmish but his slingers and archers were but a few thousand strong after a short combat they were flung back upon the legions with heavy loss absolutely overwhelmed by the concentric arrow shower which was poured in upon them the pursuing enemy then began to ride close up to the great square and to take easy shots into the mass they kept at a discreet distance some two hundred yards or so and the legionnaires were helpless against them for the pilum had but a short range and could not reach the horsemen nor was it any use to advance for the enemy slowly retired keeping always at the same distance from the legions and continuing to pour in his long deadly shafts which nailed the shield to the arm that bore it and the helmet to the head crassus now began to see the difficulties of the situation since it was impossible to contend with missile weapons against the parthians it was necessary to close at all costs accordingly he gave his son publius charge of thirteen hundred cavalry all gallic veterans fresh from caesar's wars fifteen hundred archers and eight picked cohorts of infantry and bade him sally out from the square and charge desperately into the enclosing ring of bowmen before this sudden onset the parthians gave way retiring at full speed leaving a moment's respite to the harassed legions young crassus pursued them fiercely his infantry pushing forward so rapidly that it almost kept pace with the horsemen apparently the young commander allowed himself to be carried away by the ardour of the charge and entertained a vain hope of catching up the enemy for he chased them for five or six miles till he had got quite out of touch with his father's legions then he suddenly found himself face to face with the solid supports of the elusive horse bowmen heavy squadrons of mailed lancers who met him in orderly array and offered battle at the same moment the fugitives whom he had been chasing halted and began to ply their bows from the flanks although his troops were much disordered by their long and reckless ride publius charged straight at the centre of the enemy a furious melee followed but the romans were hopelessly outnumbered and after a most gallant defence the whole detachment horse and foot was exterminated 
the triumvir advancing slowly in his son's track was horrified to meet the parthians returning with shouts of triumph and displaying the heads of publius and the other fallen officers fixed on their pikes but with a resolution which shows that the old roman spirit was not dead in him he addressed his men crying that the loss of his son was his own private concern and that the main army was intact and might yet retrieve the day and avenge their fallen comrades no campaign could be carried to a successful end without some casualties it was not by her good fortune but by her perseverance and fortitude in adversity that rome had risen to be the mistress of the world these words were not enough to stir the weary soldiery who had thoroughly lost heart and were already cursing the general who had led them into this snare in the desert it was his ignorance and presumption they complained which were the causes of their present desperate condition they held out sullenly till dusk came but when the fall of night compelled the parthians to withdraw the whole army officers and soldiers alike demanded to be led back to the euphrates a deputation went to seek for the proconsul who was found stretched on the ground with his head wrapped in his cloak mourning for his son since he seemed sunk in a dull apathy and refused to issue any orders the quaestor for crassus took it upon himself to bid the army decamp under cover of the night and make a forced march for Cari. the baggage and four thousand wounded were left to the mercy of the enemy a night retreat is always fatal to troops who have lost their nerve and the romans dropping with fatigue and wearied by twelve hours spent under arms had no longer the power to move rapidly or to keep their distances when day broke they were found straggling across the plains in half a dozen disjointed columns each of which had to shift for itself the parthians came up a few hours later and beset the retreating army some of the more belated corps and multitudes of the stragglers were cut up but the main body reached cari in the afternoon next night crassus again commenced to retreat for his troops were so demoralized that he felt sure that it was hopeless to make any stand east of the euphrates the second day of flight was as disastrous as the first the troops lost all touch with each other and the greater part of the horse leaving the infantry in the lurch never drew rein till they had saved themselves in the mountains crassus himself with only four cohorts in his company was worried all day by a swarm of horse bowmen who succeeded in intercepting his way to the hills and finally compelled him to halt and stand at bay on an isolated eminence just outside the limit of safety then followed a miserable scene of treachery the parthian vizier came up and seeing that it would be hard to storm the hill proposed a conference holding out prospects of granting a peace on condition that crassus should order the evacuation of the mesopotamian cities and retire beyond the euphrates the soldiery hailed with joy a proposal that promised a relief from their present desperate condition but the triumvir himself was not deluded and warned all those about him that the only safe course was to hold out till night and then make a dash for the hills through the lines of the enemy his exhortations produced little effect and seeing that his men were utterly demoralized and unwilling to fight any longer he consented to go down and treat it is said that he took his officers to witness that he went to his death with his eyes open but that for the credit of rome it would be better to say that the general was deceived by the enemy rather than that he had been abandoned by his own men the sequel was exactly like the scene at kabul in eighteen forty one when the unfortunate macnaughton went down to treat with akbar khan crassus and his escort were received at first with ostentatious respect and a conference was begun presently a feigned scuffle was got up and hands were laid upon the proconsul whereupon one of his legates drew his sword this acted as the necessary signal for open violence and serena's attendants fell upon the romans and dispatched them every one crassus's head was cut off and sent to seleucia to be laid before the great king every one has read of the scene that followed the arrival of the ghastly trophy a scene that illustrates accurately enough the curious admixture of savagery and civilization at the court of the arsacidae 
King Herodes was witnessing the Bacchae of Euripides, wherein King Pentheus is torn to pieces by the frantic Theban women. The actor who was playing Agave seized the head of Crassus and used it instead of the mask that represented the head of Pentheus in the wild dance at the end of the play. Herodes was charmed with the idea and presented the tragedian with a talent of silver. We must not blame Crassus too much for the disaster of Cari. Probably any other Roman general of the day, with the possible exception of Caesar, would have suffered a defeat under the same circumstances. For the Parthian method of war was utterly unknown to the Romans, and the legion, a splendid weapon against any other foe, was useless here. In later campaigns, profiting by Crassus's experience, the generals of the West never attempted to attack the Parthian in the open with an army of the old Roman type. They took into the field large bodies of cavalry and tens of thousands of foot archers. These last proved especially successful against the troops of the Arsacidae, for the Parthian bow, having to be used on horseback, was necessarily short and was outranged by that of the foot soldier. Hence the Orientals had the choice between being overmatched in archery and being forced to charge home. In both cases they usually fared ill when engaging with the Romans. There never was a second Cari, but it is hard to see how the first could have been avoided. It was a strange and inappropriate end to the life of Crassus that he should go down to history with his name attached to an error in military tactics rather than to some political or financial fiasco. But a certain inevitable futility attached to all that he undertook. He wanted power, and thrice in his life the power was placed within his hand. But when he had it, he could not use it, for he was equally destitute of an ideal and of a program. Even if Pompey had not always been at his side to check his ambition, we see that he would never have achieved anything great. The story of his career shows just how much and how little mere wealth, ambition, and industry without genius, an inspiring personality, or an honest enthusiasm could accomplish in Roman politics. End of section 16. Section 17 of Seven Roman Statesmen of the Later Republic by Charles Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 7. Cato, Part 1. Among all the statesmen with whom we have to deal in this last century of the Roman Republic, there were only two who were unselfish in their aims, looked for no personal profit, and devoted their lives to fighting for their party and their theory of the Constitution. These were the two men who, among all the figures of this troubled time, bore the least similarity to each other, Lucius Cornelius Sulla and Marcus Porcius Cato. Save that each was a devoted and disinterested partisan of the optimate faction, there is absolutely no resemblance between them. What Sulla was we have already seen, an epicurean to the core, gay, fastidious, taking life easily save in the moments of actual crisis in war or politics, but when the heat of the fray was upon him, capable of systematic cruelty on the widest scale. In all save his reactionary politics and his contempt for monarchy and its trappings, he was a typical Hellenized Roman of the decadence. Cato, on the other hand, was consistent in his reaction, he looked back to old Roman ideals, not merely in politics, but in social manners, dress, bearing, and morals. He is the most complete instance in history of what we may call deliberate archaism. The careful observance of the customs and views of an extinct generation by a man who was clever enough to see the strangeness of what he was doing, and yet persevered in it. For Cato is no mere Don Quixote, as Mumpson calls him, he did not spend his life in fighting monsters that were unreal, tilting at windmills or at flocks of sheep, or taking innkeepers and milkmaids for castellans and princesses. On the contrary, he knew precisely whom he was fighting with and what he was fighting for, 
and used every means that an honourable man might the most practical and positive no less than those mere constitutional figments in which the roman mind delighted to deal unlike a don quixote he was a thoroughly successful minister of finance and an excellent and practical soldier it was only because he fought for an impossible ideal and because he was foiled by meaner and pettier souls that he can possibly be called by the mocking name which Momsen has imposed on him marcus cato was the great-grandson of old cato the kensor a fact which was destined to colour his whole life for it was his dearest wish to copy in everything down to tricks of language and dress a man who had already been noted as somewhat quaint and old-fashioned eighty years before hence came his reputation for eccentricity it was in imitating his ancestor that cato learned to despise all fine raiment to such an extent that he habitually dressed in sombre colours he would sit in the tribunal without his shoes refused to ride when going about on public missions with his friends and would not wear a hat even when he was marching across africa in midsummer it was probably the example of the elder cato too that induced the younger to show the one concession to the spirit of the times of which he was ever guilty to study greek philosophy and keep at home as a sort of private chaplain a tame philosopher named athenodorus whom he had picked up at ephesus it is fortunate that plutarch has preserved for us a long and detailed life of cato it is from anecdotes there related that we are able to make out how a man who was somewhat eccentric in his habits and somewhat idealistic in his political views was able to exercise so considerable a sway over the politics of his own day the sway always exerted by the man who knows his own mind is perfectly consistent and is ready at any personal risk however great to act in accordance with his conscience in a time when every one else was peculiarly slack and acquiescent and given to the grossest opportunism the man who refused to yield to the stress of affairs or the spirit of the times and rigidly did his duty got an influence far beyond that to which his merely intellectual powers entitled him cato was born in b c ninety five the earliest notices that we have of him show him displaying the same inflexible courage and the same adherence to old views wrong as well as right which distinguished him down to his death his father died when he was very young and he was brought up by his maternal uncle the celebrated popular leader drusus the house of drusus was haunted during his agitation by the prominent italians for whom he was working the men who afterwards led the revolt when he had been murdered quintus pompidius silo was staying with drusus when he fell in with the boy cato aged five and his younger half-brother servilius caepio come my good children you will help your uncle drusus will you not to assist us poor italians in getting our freedom said the marcian servilius lisped a polite assent but cato had already picked up political views and did not love italians he said not a word and appeared from his silence and his surly looks inclined to deny the request pompidius half irritated half in jest took him to the window and held him out of it by the scruff of his neck threatening if he would not promise to let him drop this he did in a harsh tone and at the same time gave him several shakes as if he were about to let go but as the child bore this for some time without any marks of concern or fear pompidius set him down observing i verily believe that if this boy were a man we should not get even one vote among the roman people nine years later when cato was fourteen he was taken by his optimate relatives to visit sulla at the time of the proscriptions while he was waiting with his pedagogue sarpedon in the hall he saw several delators bring the heads of democratic leaders to the dictator's house and receive money for them at this he was very wroth and asked his tutor why somebody does not kill this man because said sarpedon men fear him more than they hate him then give me a sword said cato and i will go in and make away with him for evidently he is enslaving his country 
so obviously in earnest was he that he had to be hurried out of the house to prevent his doing something violent and to be narrowly watched for some time cato first appeared in public life some four or five years after this incident attending the courts like other young romans of his age there he acquired a very good knowledge of law and taught himself a kind of oratory which as we are told differed much from the florid style of hortensius and the careful elaborateness of cicero for there was neither heat nor artificiality in it all was rough strong and sensible yet he had a turn for natural humour and a clear exposition which served him as well as the studied eloquence of others besides attending in the law courts the young roman had to serve his stipendia in the field cato saw his first service in the cohors praetoria of the proconsul gellius in the unhappy servile war with spartacus he was noted as one of the few officers in the contemptible army of b c seventy two who did his work punctually and intelligently he was offered crowns and promotions by gellius but refused them saying that he had only done his duty and nothing that deserved honour when the servile war ended he went to macedonia and served under the proconsul rubrius in b c sixty eight with the office of military tribune which gave him a turn in the command of a legion his troops soon obtained a good name in the province because instead of caring for his own comfort like other officers he insisted on living with his men and taking no better rations than they on the march though his freedmen rode on horses he insisted on going on foot with his soldiers and on carefully putting himself in the way of every fatigue that came to them yet he would not allow undue familiarity was unhesitating in the application of punishments and sternly repressed plundering so that as plutarch says it was doubted whether his legion was more peaceable or more warlike more valiant or more well behaved having now passed twenty-four the age at which it was possible to stand for the quaestorship he came back to rome but refused to solicit the magistracy till he had spent many months in getting up all the duties and functions of a quaestor so that he stood a year late for the office his year was notable in the history of the quaestorship for the thorough reformation which he made he found the treasury almost entirely in the hands of the permanent under-secretaries who had the routine of the business in their hands and did practically what they liked with the young and inexperienced quaestors who generally entered the office entirely ignorant of their functions and were only just beginning to learn them when they found their twelve months at an end but cato started with his duties and powers at his fingers ends and soon detected the permanent clerks committing all sorts of irregularities and illegalities to their own private profit he turned out one chief clerk for embezzlement and another for forgery though it set a hornet's nest of friends and patrons of the offenders about his ears having humbled the secretaries he took the whole management of the irarium in his own hands his lazy and indifferent colleagues gladly allowing him to bear all the burden in a short time it is said he made the treasury much more respectable than the senate and his quaestorship more memorable than most consulates for he recovered an immense amount of outstanding debts owed by men of mark whom his predecessor had not dared to press and at the same time paid off a number of bills owed by the state to poor men which the unhappy creditors had long despaired of recovering one extraordinary instance of his courage has been preserved finding a list of sulla's delators and of the sums they had been paid for the murders they had committed he compelled all the survivors to pay back the blood money because as he said it had been an illegal disbursement never justified by any decree of the people when his year of office was running out cato had a complete chart and analysis of the public revenues for the last ten years made out at the personal expense to himself of five talents he kept it and it proved invaluable to future quaestors who always came to consult him when in difficulties and to get his lights on the meaning of difficult points in the annual balance sheet of the republic at thirty-one then cato had a fair military record and was acknowledged to be the best financial expert in the senate a reputation which he preserved till his death.
he would seem to have intended to spend some time in getting up the duties of the higher offices of state but was suddenly called into activity by the catalinarian conspiracy he is generally remembered for the support that he gave to cicero through all the troubles of b c sixty three yet curiously enough he was on one occasion brought into violent collision with the consul he prosecuted muraina the optimate consul elect for b c sixty two for bribery at the elections and when he came into the court found cicero opposing him as the defendant's advocate the offence had been a gross one and the consul had nothing better to do in the way of defence than to follow the good old forensic maxim if you have no case abuse the plaintiff's attorney accordingly he grew offensively personal jeering at stoics and hinting that cato's love of purity and legality might be in place in some ideal republic but not in rome till he set the jury in a roar cato was defeated but contented himself with remarking that rome had a very facetious consul he took no offence at the ridicule that had been poured on him and remained a consistent supporter of cicero End of section seventeen section eighteen of seven roman statesmen of the later republic by charles ullman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter seven cato part two the first occasion on which we find cato exercising a really great influence on politics was at the celebrated debate on the execution of lentulus and cathagus and the other catalinarian conspirators speaking as a very junior senator toward the end of the meeting he completely undid caesar's feat of inclining the senate to change the vote from death to banishment though caesar had been so effective that he had actually induced Solanus, the proposer of the death penalty to change round and accept the milder alternative the speech which cato actually uttered is certainly not that given by sallust who after the manner of other ancient historians has constructed an oration out of his inner consciousness for the words which he puts in cato's mouth do not at all agree with the notes in plutarch and the latter implies that he had seen the actual oration which was taken down at the time by cicero's shorthand writers the chief point in plutarch's version is that cato attacked caesar by name charged him with being concerned in catiline's designs for subverting the republic and said that he might think himself fortunate for not being on trial along with cathagus and his crew the unscrupulous sallust evades these points being evidently set on keeping out of sight anything that might redound to the discredit of his patron caesar cato's activity was strenuously displayed all through the year of the conspiracy but in that which followed he was even more prominently before the eyes of the public in the autumn when he thought that he might snatch a moment's leisure he had set out for his estates in lucania but on the way he met metellus nepos who was coming to rome from the east as pompey's political agent hearing that nepos was about to stand for the tribunate in order that he might lay before the people his patron's demands cato grew excited this is no time for rural delights he cried and turned his face back toward the city for like so many other romans of that day he was firmly convinced that pompey was aiming at a tyranny and that his return to the city would be the signal for a coup d'etat accordingly he conceived it his duty to endeavour to hold metellus in check and stood against him at the tribunicial elections both were successful and the year b c sixty two was made lively by their interminable quarrels their main dispute was on the occasion when metellus made his very unsuccessful proposal that pompey should be called home from the east to quench the embers of the catilinarian rising a project which he must have made on his own inspiration and without his patron's knowledge since antonius had crushed the insurgents at pistoria there was no serious work for pompey to do the proposal seemed to cato entirely sinister it confirmed the worst suspicions that he had nourished concerning nepos and his employer 
the project was absurd he said but metellus's stupidity was so great that it sometimes became formidable accordingly he determined to use his tribunicial veto to the uttermost while i live he was heard to say pompey shall never enter armed into the city this determination led him into the first of those riotous scenes in the assembly of which he was so often to be the centre during the next twelve years on the day on which metellus proposed to introduce his bill he packed the forum with gladiators and hired bravos and enlisted the support of caesar whose talents for mob management were considered to be unrivalled till clodius arose and carried the art one stage farther it appears strange to find caesar aiding a partisan of pompey at this date apparently he did so from sheer mischief one of his reasons being that he was disgusted with cato for foiling him at the trial of lentulus and cathagus the other that he wished to embroil pompey with the optimates as a leader of the democratic party he did not really wish to see the army of the east and its general transferred to italy but it would profit the populares if the pompeians could be induced to ask for over great and unconstitutional powers for their chief and it would be no less desirable to set pompeians and optimates at daggers drawn by inducing the senate to commit themselves to open antagonism to the measures proposed by nepos accordingly caesar lent himself as a supporter to the unwise demands which the latter was making on the day of assembly the mob which metellus and caesar had brought with them looked so threatening that cato's friends besought him not to risk himself among them but the element of personal safety never entered into his calculations he ploughed his way through the tumultuous crowd and found caesar and nepo seated side by side on the rostra at once he plumped himself down between them it looked rude but it had the effectual result of preventing them from communicating easily with each other when nepos began to read his bill cato rose and interposed his veto encouraged by the shouts of his partisans pompey's friend ignored the interruption and continued to recite his preamble thereupon his colleague suddenly snatched up the document from his hand and tore it up nothing daunted metellus went on with his clauses speaking from memory this was too much for cato who assisted by another optimate tribune one minutius thermus seized the orator pulled him back to his seat and laid his hands on his mouth nepos as might have been expected shouted to his friends that violence was being used against his sacrosanct person the mob stormed the platform and cato was assailed with sticks and stones his life was only saved by the consul marina who covered him with his gown and hurried him into a neighbouring temple seeing the coast clear and his adversary driven off nepos began once more to recite his bill but he had not got far when cato much battered though he was emerged from his place of shelter with a few friends at his heels and charged the rostra from the rear the whole meeting broke up into a riot order could not be restored and the bill was never carried probably caesar was as pleased at the fiasco as was cato himself for he can never have intended that pompey should really be recalled he had merely wished to provoke bad blood between pompeians and optimates and in this he had certainly succeeded metellus then went back to the east to report his failure to his patron after having denounced cato as an enemy of his country and a conspirator against its most worthy son accusations which not even the most fanatical democrat or pompeian could take seriously when at last pompey came home in person cato was still in the same mind concerning him he was fully convinced that he was aiming at despotic power and never attempted to separate the foolish projects of nepos from the very reasonable requests which pompey himself laid before the senate and people considering the extreme moderation of the general's demands there was no reason why he and the senate should not have come to an agreement and have united to keep down the democrats the two chief hindrances in the way were the foolish vanity of cicero whose conduct we have already had occasion to relate and cato's ungovernable suspicion of all that pompey said and did
the general endeavoured to conciliate him by every means in his power went out of his way to explain his harmless intentions and even requested the hand of cato's niece servilia for his son Nias as a token of reconciliation cato was utterly unconvinced imagined that an attempt was being made to bribe him with a great alliance and sent away the friend who brought pompey's message with the reply that he was not to be caught with a female snare so far indeed was he from being conciliated that it was undoubtedly he more than any other single person who made peace between pompey and the senate impossible and ultimately drove the much provoked general into the arms of crassus and caesar it was cato who induced the senate to refuse to ratify pompey's treaties and grants in asia the plea which he used was that lucullus had also made arrangements with the asiatic states some of which conflicted with those of his successor in justice to lucullus and those with whom he had negotiated cato declared that it was necessary not to ratify pompey's doings on block but to go through each document separately after comparing it with the previous obligations contracted by his predecessor this was rational enough in itself but the result was unfortunate convinced at last that he would never get decent treatment from the senate the outraged general was forced into his alliance with the democrats there is something in plutarch's conclusion that judging by the event cato was in the wrong though much was to be said in favour of discussing the treaty separately yet the result was that by forcing pompey to league himself with caesar he indirectly brought about the ruin of the republic cato at this time made himself no less odious to cicero than to pompey by breaking up the concordia ordinum the alliance of senate and equites against the anarchic forces in the state which had been brought about by the catilinarian insurrection the consul of b c sixty three had enlisted all men of property in defence of the existing constitution by the lurid account which he gave of the conspiracy and its ends as long as the equites were kept estranged from their old leader crassus by memories of the plot the democratic party was shorn of one of its strongest elements but at last there arose a question on which the interest of the state and that of the equestrian order clashed the great syndicate of capitalists which had contracted to raise the tithes of asia found that it was making a worse bargain than it had expected and came to the senate with the request that the terms of the agreement might be varied in its favour cicero admitted in private that such a demand was impudent they had entered into the contract with their eyes open and it was by no means proved that they were making an actual loss but the whole equestrian order was directly or indirectly interested in the business and the orator was so convinced of the necessity of keeping them allied to the senate that he was prepared to support them not so cato he had gone into the figures and had come to the conclusion that there was no rational necessity for varying the contract why should disappointed speculators be compensated for receiving a less percentage of profit than they had calculated upon obtaining he made out such a clear case against the proposal that it was rejected cicero was disgusted cato he complained speaks as if he was dealing with the ideal commonwealth of plato not with our corrupt and decadent rome morally he was right practically he caused the resentful equites to quit their alliance with the optimates and to turn once more to their old friend crassus june b c sixty that by estranging the actual or possible allies of the senate he was dooming his party to destruction was no concern to cato his principle was that a loyal citizen must not do evil that good may come that anything is better than opportunism and that it is far more important to have a clear conscience than to score a temporary political success if evil days were at hand he was perfectly prepared to fight by every device that an honest man might use but he would not buy support from any quarter by what he considered corrupt concessions the crisis was not very long delayed when caesar came back from spain in the summer of b c sixty and the disheartened pompey consented to join him and crassus in forming the first triumvirate cato took arms at once 
his first achievement was to talk out caesar's demand for a triumph in order to sue for the consulship for the next year the returning general was bound to enter rome by a fixed day in order to triumph he had to obtain the senate's approval before he passed the gates there happened to be only one meeting at which the motion could be taken into consideration when it came cato beat the record of the ancient world by making a speech which lasted the whole day it was not a good speech as even his friends allowed but it served the desired purpose caesar more set on obtaining the consulship than the triumph was obliged to quit his legions and enter the city in order to begin his canvass he was disgusted with the obstructionist orator and never forgave him of all the opponents with whom he clashed during his stormy career cato was the only one for whom he nourished a real dislike he showed it by publishing a very bitter and unfair satire the anti cato against his memory after he had fallen in the civil war a deed that contrasts strangely with his usual magnanimity to his adversaries after the turbulent consulship of caesar and bibulus began on the first of january b c fifty nine cato had plenty of occupation provided for him when the julian laws which were to consolidate the triumvirate began to be brought forward he came down to the forum to oppose every one of them at the first great riot when caesar illegally refused to listen to his colleague's veto and went on with his legislative proposals in face of every constitutional hindrance we find cato at the side of bibulus enduring in his company the storm of stones and blows when at last the democrats drove them out of the assembly it was cato who brought up the rear refusing to hurry as he went and turning every now and then to tell the unheeding rabble of pursuers that they were lunatics as well as bad citizens when bibulus had retired to the safety of his house and contented himself with putting up a daily notice that no legal meetings of the comitia could be held as he was intending to observe the heavens cato sought no similar shelter he came down to oppose the law for distributing the campanian lands and spoke so bitterly that caesar had him dragged from the rostrum and sent to prison though he soon allowed him to be released by a friendly tribune when the question of the asiatic tax farmers was brought up in the senate he tried to talk out the proposal as he had talked out the question of caesar's triumph seven months before but the consul had him stopped in the midst of his harangue and no one dared to protest at the most important assembly of the year that in which the disreputable tribune vitinius carried the law which made caesar governor of gaul cato again came down to protest he told the citizens that they were voting a tyrant into the citadel when they gave the triumvir the all-important cisalpine province and the legions that lay in it but it was to no purpose cato had liberated his conscience by making his protest but he had no other consolation all that he had succeeded in accomplishing was to make caesar use illegal violence in a way that in the eyes of strict constitutionalists vitiated all his legislation but strict constitutionalists were a negligible quantity at rome in those unhappy days End of section eighteen